Chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. We're reading from New King James Version. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. We are so grateful that we still have natural light, even though we may not have electricity and artificial light, so that you can at least um, read your Bible and I can read my um, preaching notes and um, conduct our service, even though it is evening service. Now, last week we had a wonderful time of Bible seminar, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and the theme was basically um, church, but uh, more particularly we looked at on Sunday about becoming part of the, the family of God, because the church is actually described or compared to the family of God or God's household. So today we'd like to continue on with that a little bit and um, before we actually go back to the Gospel of Mark uh, from Ephesians chapter 2 and have a look at living in God's family. So once you're born again into God's family and become a member of God's family, then, then how should you go about living as members of God's family? And that's what we'd like to see from our main, uh, passage taken from Ephesians chapter 2 today. Now, when you talked about family or God's household, we talked about the fact that it is one. Um, it talks about the oneness of the family of God. There is, in fact, one universal church. Um, there are many local churches and churches that existed throughout the history, but there is, in fact, one body of Christ. And we are all part of that and members of the household of God. The church is one collectively, but we individually are members. We can say that as that one universal church, it is um, a kind of perfect man, or we are being made to be a complete or perfect man as we read in Colossians chapter 1. Of course, by no means are we perfect, but it talks about the perfect nature of God's creation, new creation, the church. Or we can look at it in this way. The Bible sometimes uses the word sanctification in two different ways, one in positional way, and the other in conditional way. We are positionally sanctified. We have been cleansed or we have been justified. And we have been conditionally sanctified. That is to say that we are becoming more and more holy, more like Christ. So in a sense, the family of God is perfect and complete because God's work is finished. God's work of saving us. The, the work of Christ in salvation is finished and perfect. So we are part of that perfect family but this family is still being built up as more people come into Christ and into the family of God. And also this family of God is being built up uh, in a way, conditional way, um, and sanctified so that we, can, we become more and more like Christ and we become more godly and, and holy in our condition. But in a sense, um, this is all happening because the work of Christ is all done and it is complete. And in a sense, once you come into this family of God, whether you like it or not, you're part of the family. And once you're part of the family, then you are in that family forever. As someone said, if you are going to live together in heaven eternally, then shouldn't we also live together in this world? Um, not as in, in perfect way as we will in heaven, but that talks about the life in community, life together. Uh, that we live in the body of Christ. And that's basically living as God's family or living in God's family. And the local churches need to embody that oneness, that family unity as much as they can. Living with love and caring one another. And at the same time, living with accountability, sometimes even correcting one another and disciplining one another by the word of God, 
rebuking one another by the word of God and admonishing one another with the truth in the Bible. And all of this is happening in an environment where God's forgiveness and grace and mercy are all practiced. And the love of God saturates in all the things that we do as local churches. You can say that you have positionally perfect collective universal church and local churches are being conditionally sanctified to conform to that image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the book of Ephesians actually illustrates that very well by using the family analogy. Of course, you know, when you go to chapter 5 and chapter 6, there is a teaching about family relationship, husbands and wives and parents and children, um, how they are to interact with one another, especially in the household of faith. But nonetheless, um, the greater theme in the, in the book of Ephesians is not just family life or home life for Christians, but it is the life that we live together in the spiritual family, the church. So keep that in mind and have a look at the context first before we get into more details in chapter 2. Now Ephesians chapter 2 talks about the fact that the Jews and the Gentiles have come into that family of God. And that's very important context and background information because Paul makes reference to the fact that the Jews and the Gentiles were basically different people from the beginning. And yet, they were brought together in this unity of the Holy Spirit, the church. And when Paul was writing this letter, and we know the story, uh, we know the context a little bit. Um, the Jews were, well, they were proud, proud people, thinking that they were the chosen people of God. And because of that, they kind of looked down upon the Gentiles. And um, you can even look at the way they despised the Samaritans and Gentiles in the Gospel accounts. And even from historical information that we know that the Jews were very um, different from Gentiles in, in their practice, in their customs, and they had this tendency to feel superior to the Gentiles. And because of that, there was a great barrier between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews looked down on Gentiles, and Gentiles also despised the Jews for their arrogance, and the two kinds of people could not be any further away from uh, one another. In fact, that separation was so great that even in churches where there were Jews, um, Jewish Christians, and Gentile Christians were together, they really had a difficult time um, you know, coming together in some form of unity. And their social separation also um, flowed on to the, the different classes of people as well. There were masters and slaves, uh, people who were of noble family and people who were from more common background. And, and all these differences in backgrounds and race and ethnicity actually played a part in the church, especially when the church had problems and dissensions um, and conflicts and so on. But Paul says, no, none of these things should really matter. And we are to endeavor to maintain the unity of the Holy Spirit which is given to us in the church. And it is all because Christ has brought the Jews and Gentiles together as one people. And as we saw even last week um, in 2 Corinthians, Paul basically says that there are three kinds of people. There are the Jews, and there are the Gentiles, and then there are the church, or, or there's the church, the church assembly of saved people, both from the Jews and the Gentiles. And there's no longer the distinction of being a Jew or a Gentile in the church, because we have all come together in this unity. But when you look at the way they actually perceive that in the, old, in the New Testament times, you can see that the Jewish people, even in churches, had really difficult time grappling with that thought. Because uh, if you go through the book of Acts, for example, um, there are stories about the Jewish people trying to um, basically um, teach the Gentiles that they have to become gen um, Jews before they can become Christians. Sometimes they taught the Gentiles that they have to keep all these laws from the Old Testament. And sometimes um, even Peter himself made that error. Um, they even practiced the Jewish things um, that set them apart from the Gentiles. Uh, Peter was at one time eating with Gentile Christians, but when some Jewish Christians came to the church in Galatia, um, Peter kind of um, um, set himself apart from the Gentiles and separated himself, um, did not eat with the Gentile Christians, and Paul later rebuked him really severely for that um, mistake or for that error. So even the churches had that mistake. Um, it went on for quite some time. 
But you need, you need to really have a look at the very purpose why God chose Israel from the first place to dispel that um, wrong ideas. Think about that. When God chose Israel, for what purpose did God choose Israel from the first place? You go back all the way to the time of Abraham, and God chose Abraham from the people who did not know God. And God said to Abraham, I will make your nation so that this nation would know who I am and would worship me. But that's not the end. If you look at not only the New Testament, but also the Old Testament, you can see that the mandate of God to his people, whether Israelites or Christians, was to basically preach the gospel, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to preach the message of God, to preach the word of God to all nations. If you look at the Old Testament, a lot of Psalms, or even in the Pentateuch, the books that Moses had written, there is reference to the fact that God wants them, God wanted Israelites to preach the word of God to all nations. Often Psalms, like the Psalm that we have read in Psalm 98, um, these Psalms um, sing the fact that all the creation, including all the nations, singing praise to God, not just the Jewish people, but for the Gentiles as well. In other words, God chose Israelites and set them apart for the purpose of preaching the word of God to all the other nations. Not just to be superior people. Not just to be some peculiar people that kept certain things that God told them to do. Certain customs and certain traditions and statutes and so on. But that's what they thought. They thought that they were chosen by God to be some special people of God, to be a kind of superior people compared to all the other nations. And they were quite proud of the fact that they were given the oracles of God, the word of God, that they were given special blessing of God, and they had this tendency to be proud and to look down upon other non-chosen people. We have a term that we use for Israel, and that is that Israel was chosen as a missionary nation. Missionary nation. It's a great term that can be used um, not only in the Old Testament times, but also in the New Testament times, because we know what missionary or missions means in our time. It is to preach the word of God, to preach the gospel of God. And God chose Israel so that they would become a missionary nation to the ends of the earth. In a sense, as a nation, they failed. But as a church, they succeeded because the early church Christians were basically all Jewish people. The 12 apostles were Jewish men. And they went forth and preached the gospel to all nations, and the gospel went to all the peoples all over the world. Now, sometimes people, you know, when they learn about Israel and all these blessings in the Old Testament times, um, some people think, well, why did God choose Israel? Why didn't God choose our nation, for example? Sometimes you might think that if God had chosen our nation as his own people, then that would mean that we have um, some special blessing from him. Maybe, you know, we would, would have gone and preached the gospel to other people, unlike Israelites. Um, but anyway, that would have been better for us. But that is to be ignorant of the fact that God's universal purpose was not just to choose one nation and set them apart, but to choose them, and yes, to set them apart for the purpose of blessing the whole world, all the people, to draw his people into his family, the church, both from Israel, the chosen nation, and from the Gentiles. And that's why the Bible in the New Testament um, it uses the word, the elect, both from the Jews and the Gentiles. People who have come into the church by God's sovereign election and become his people, regardless of their background or ethnicities. But sadly, if you look around now, churches sometimes make the same mistake, maybe even more times than not. They make the mistake of looking only inwardly. There are some churches, even in Baptist denominations, that are on the decline. There are some churches that have been in existence for a long time, hundreds of years, more than 100 years, and um, they're declining, and, and not only that, um, they are only inward looking so that they do not reach out to the community with the gospel. 
They stress perhaps being set apart like the Israelites. And they even stress the fact that they need to be holy and separate from the world. But they forget that the very purpose why God commanded us to be holy and separate from the world is to be missionary people to the rest of the world. And that's a very dangerous mistake. And even as Christians, we should remember that and learn from that mistake. And as uh, individual Christian, uh, Christians or even as a church, we should always remember that the very, very fact that we are to be different people from the rest of the world is not just to be different and to be better than them, but it is to preach the gospel to them so that more people can be drawn into the body of Christ. And that's a very, very important point. And that's why Paul says, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you have come in together to the church. And there's this oneness and this unity of the Holy Spirit. And he reminds us that the very definition of church includes being missional. That's a kind of background information and the backdrop with which we look at this text in chapter 2 in the book of Ephesians. We take it from verse 19, we pick up from verse 19, and up to chapter 2, verse 18, Paul basically talks about the, the grace of God and salvation, his election, uh, the church, and this barrier between the Jews and the Gentiles have come down. And he says, now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Now, who is you? Now, you refers to, these, um, to the Jewish people, um, sorry, to the Christians in Ephesians, both Jewish people and Gentiles. There were uh, both groups of people in the church in Ephesus. Especially for those people who are, in, uh, who, who are Gentiles by their background, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you have become fellow citizens and the saints and members of the household of God. That's a kind of summary statement for what Paul had been saying in chapter 1 and chapter 2 in Ephesians. Now, it indicates that Paul is now trying to say something new, and therefore implies that he's building this argument upon what he had said in chapter 1 and chapter 2. So when you look at the context, you understand that Paul is trying to say something very important on the basis of what he had been speaking until now. Now, in our text, there are, about, there are two parts. There are two parts before and now. Before and after, before and now. And now actually has a few points in it. So we'll have a look at before, the condition before we came to salvation, and now after we have come to salvation, and some few points um, in that um, what's happening in our time now, uh, in the present time. It's a little like our BEST story that we've been sharing for some time before. Um, BEST stands for before, before salvation. E is event that led to salvation. S is salvation. And today is what's happening today in our time, in our life, um, now at the present time. Um, and basically Paul is saying, look, this is how you were like before. But now this is happening. And he says, no longer. No, we are no longer strangers and foreigners. And the expression no longer implies that we were strangers and we were foreigners before. Especially in the context of Ephesian church and for the Gentile Christians, they were in fact strangers and foreigners even to the commonwealth of God. That is to say, even to the chosen nation Israel. And of course, before they came to Christ, they were strangers and foreigners to the things of God and even to the grace of salvation. So, what was it like before? Before there were strangers. What does it mean? Strangers were people who are not known. Now, if you look at Galatians chapter 1, Paul says this, you have known God, or rather you have, you have been known by God. Now, that implies that when you come to know God, it is not only that you know God, but you are also known by God. It talks about the two-way nature of the relationship. When you are saved, it's not enough that you're only knowing about God. You need to be known by God. It's like saying that you can say that I know the president of this nation, I know the prime minister of this nation, but he doesn't know you. She doesn't know you. 
there is no real relationship there. You can read a book about the president and know about him, but it doesn't mean that he knows you. A saving knowledge is not only that you know about God and what Christ has done, but he has to know you. So the question is, does God know you? Not only that you know God, but does God know you? Are you a stranger to God? Are you a stranger to Christ? That's what we were before, but no longer. So we were strangers to God. We were strangers to Christ. And also he says, we are no longer foreigners. Now foreigners have no inheritance. Foreigners have no status. They have no place in the kingdom of God. Even in this world, if you are not a citizen of a particular nation, then you have no right to enter the country unless you're given a visa or some, um, some right to enter the country by a way of wavering the visa requirement. If you're not a citizen of the nation, then you cannot stay in that nation indefinitely. But if you are, you have the right to stay and live in the country. But spiritually, we were foreigners. We had no place in the kingdom of God. We had no inheritance of the things of God. But that's what we were like before we came to Christ. In fact, people must know this in order to be saved, isn't it? And that's why when you preach the gospel, you also preach not only the fact that God is loving and gracious and we are saved by his love and grace, but we also have to tell them that without Christ, without God's salvation, you are strangers. You are foreigners to the kingdom of God and to the things of God. You are basically outside the kingdom of God. We also tell them that everyone comes as a stranger, as a foreigner, because no one is a Christian from the beginning. No one comes as a citizen of the kingdom of God. No one comes as a member of the God's family. You come as a stranger. You come as a foreigner. But only when you're saved, you come into the family of God. That's who we were. That's before. This is quite important because I have seen many so-called Christians who do not remember or who, do not, who are not able to articulate their condition before they came to Christ. Especially people who have grown up in Christian families or Christian traditions. They cannot really remember the time when they, become, when they have become Christians. To them, they have always been in some kind of church background and church situation and church family and, and Christian family. So they always have been kind of saved into, in their understanding. But the Bible says clearly that no one comes to Christ by being born into a family um, that, that is Christian. You don't become Christian by the will of man or because of some family descent by bloodline but it is only by God's grace you're saved. So we have the time when we are before Christians, before we were strangers and foreigners. But here it says in verse, um, if you look at verse um, 19 and 20, it says in the middle of verse 19, but fellow citizens and members of the household of God, Verse 20, having been built on the foundations of the apostles. In verse 21, we are being fitted together so that we can become the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. It's a long sentence, but picking these important verses and clauses actually help us understand with some clarity. You were strangers and you are foreigners but you have been built together and you're still being fitted and built together as a dwelling place of God so that God can live in you. That's essentially the summary of our text here. Now there are two analogies to start with here in verse 19, citizens and the members of the family of God. We saw that last week in more detail. Now this is very significant because Paul is speaking to a Gentile church by and large. Now these people are not citizens of Israel 
And these, peop these people were, before they were saved, these people were not citizens of the kingdom of God. And therefore, to tell them that they are citizens of the kingdom of God, citizens of heavenly kingdom, is very, very significant. And this is also um, in times when, for example, Roman citizenship was very privileged. And Paul was a Roman citizen, and he could um, basically use this analogy to tell them what privilege that they had by being citizens of the kingdom of God. It's a wonderful analogy. And also he's saying, look, you're not only citizens of the kingdom of God, which can be a little bit impersonal, you're members of the household of God, which is very, very personal. You have come into the family of God. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you're a free man or a slave, it doesn't matter, you have come into the family of God and become members of God's family. This is done. This is something that has happened in the past. We are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are members of the family of God. And we saw that in, in some depth last week. What does it mean to be, be members of the family of God? You must be born into the family of God, and that is to be born again by God's grace. And we have come into this relationship uh, in the family of God, and there is only one relationship in the family of God, Father and the Son, and we became God's sons. And that means we became God's heirs together with Christ, co-heirs with Christ, and we will receive the inheritance of God. But that's all done. It is all finished. In fact, if you look at um, verse 20, it says, having been built... That having been built refers back to verse 19. So, yes, you are now fellow citizens and you are members of the family of God, having been built on this foundation and the chief cornerstone. So the word built is quite important here as well. It actually means to finish the structure of, the whole, of which the foundation has already been, been laid. So this word built is not to build from scratch. It is not to make something from new, but it is to actually build on the foundation that has already been laid. It is to finish the structure. And notice it says, having been built. Now there is the expression that actually implies that this is something that's finished. And that's why at the beginning I, I told you that the family of God is something that is already complete. It is perfected. It is finished. In a sense that the work of Christ to bring this family of God or this household of God into existence is already done. It's like saying that the saving work of God is, is finished. The work of Christ in terms of saving us is all done. So this structure, this church, this body of Christ, this building that is now being built, it, is ha it, has, it has been built, but it is also being built, but it has been built and complete on this foundation that's, that's already been laid. And what kind of foundations? Now he says here in verse 20, foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now that refers to the teaching of the apostles, the doctrines of the apostles as we read in Acts chapter 1, and also the prophets, prophets that have preached the word of God. And prophets refer to basically people who, who taught the word of God, not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament times, in the churches as well. So all these teachings that have been delegated from Christ, to the apostles and the prophets, pastors and teachers, now the church is now uh, being, the church has been built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. But more importantly, there is also the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ, in verse 20. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So imagine this. If you're building a structure like a house, you have the chief cornerstone or the cornerstone. On that cornerstone, you build a foundation. And on that foundation, you build the frame and the structure. And that structure, the church, is finished. And as we will see in verse 21 and 22, it is now being fitted together. It is now being joined by all these other things that make up this church, that make the church more complete conditionally. But when it comes to positional um, status, it, it's already done. The cornerstone is already there, foundation is already laid, there's no more any need for a new foundation, and the structure, the framework is already being built, 
uh, it, it's already been built and now it is all filled with other things that make up the church. And that's the analogy that Paul pictures in this text. The cornerstone also is, is very important. As you know, that the cornerstone is basically huge stone that they used to lay before they built any structure. Um, usually it is the cornerstone, so it sits on the corner of a building. It acts as a reference point. So when you lay, the, lay a cornerstone, that's basically from which you build everything else. That's the fra reference frame, um, and that's the point that you basically measure everything against. Not only that, usually these, um, this, this chief cornerstone is, is large enough and it is set on a very solid foundation um, on, on the ground, on the earth, so that some weight of the structure can basically um, be borne by the chief cornerstone. It cannot be moved once it is set in place. It is a stone that is large enough to bear the weight of the structure. So once the chief cornerstone is set, there is no compromise. And that's basically true with Christ. We cannot compromise regarding the teaching of Jesus Christ. Any teaching that deviates from the orthodox teaching of Jesus Christ is basically heresy. We learned that some months ago. When they deny, for example, the deity of Christ or humanity of Christ, when you deny the work of Christ, then you're talking about heretical teachings. So you have the chief cornerstone. And you have the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, the teaching that was given to them by Christ, the teaching that they taught and basically um, started this, the early church uh, movement in the book of Acts and, and the following times. This is basically what makes the church um, with the foundations and, and the chief cornerstone. And verse 21, we come to more um, kind of more relevant um, points here because it talks about what's been happening since then. And once that's already done and, and finished, it says in verse 21, in, in whom, that is in Christ, the whole building, it is being fitted together. It is also growing, we are growing into a holy temple in the Lord. It is being fitted. We are being joined together and framed together. So if you pictured that, um, that house with the cornerstone and the foundation and the framework, it is now being fitted and joined together with all the other things. You can imagine the walls going up, the bricks uh, laid one by one to make up the wall and perhaps some even putting the windows in and even internal linings and, and ceilings and all the other fittings are joined together and fitted to the structure. And that makes up the body of Christ more complete. We can say that this is a picture of local churches. Local churches uh, springing up in different places and becoming more complete in Christ as they are going through conditional sanctification. And all in all, these are all making the, the collective church, the universal church, or global church more perfect and to become more like Christ. So we grow into the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 22, the, the last part of verse 21 and 22 talk about the temple. So we are growing together into, notice it says, a holy temple. Holy temple. Now look at verse 21, the beginning. It says, the building it is being fitted together. Now this talks about how. This is how we live as Christians in the family of God. This is how the church of God is growing as a building. And it says also we grow, the church grows into, and this is more about what. This is how the church lives, and this is what is happening now, and it gives us also the purpose for all these things. It says, in whom you are being built together for the purpose of being a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So how and what and purpose. We are being fitted together, we are growing together so that we can become the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And this is really the most important and concluding point that Paul gives in this text. Think about this. If you've built your own house um, through a builder or maybe even by yourself, you can perhaps imagine that time. Now you've got the site, 
you lay a cornerstone and you lay foundation and you build up all the frames and then um, you build the building uh, more complete to be more complete by putting in the walls and, and ceilings and roof and all the fittings together why do you do that? in other words why do you build your house? the very reason why you build your house from the first place is for you to go in and live you want to go and inhabit the place it, it's your place of living I mean it would be tragic if you build your house and never have, have any chance to live inside your house, your own house. You, you dream of this building your house and you even design your building, your house, whether it's single story or two story, you make up all, all the, um, the rooms and, and where the living room is going to be and, and the kitchen and the bedroom. You make sure that it is the way you want and for the convenience of your family. So you finish your building and you want to go and live in that building. So you build your house for a dwelling place. You know, very axiomatic, just obvious truth. Then why does God build his own church? We can say that the ultimate purpose is to bring us all into the kingdom of God. But if God really wanted to do that, he could have just saved us and taken us into heaven straight away, immediately. He doesn't do that. He still leaves us in this world. Of course, we can say that you know, we are still here because we have some work to do. They all tie together. How then can we do that work more effectively? By being a dwelling place of God. The reason why God still leaves us in this world is for us to be the dwelling place of God. You can say that there's a little difference here between this analogy and actual building of your house. When you build your house, you want to finish the work and complete the building and then go in. Although I have seen people who are kind of doing the building project and still living you know, in that half-finished home. Of course, they want to finish the work and live in a complete house. But when it comes to the church, God wants to and He does dwell in the building, the church, even though it may not be complete. And that's where positional aspect and conditional aspect uh, can help us to understand because yes the church is positionally perfect so there's nothing wrong with God dwelling in the church the body of Christ but it is being conditionally perfect so that we can become a better place for God's dwelling place in other words yes God started this church the building of God or the body of Christ so that God can come and live in this building and he has and he is doing that. He's been doing that for thousands of years in the church of God. But he also wants to make his church more perfect, more complete, more sanctified, so that we can be a more effective dwelling place of God. He's building his church so that he can come in and live in his church. That's a quite a... Um, quite a striking thought and we know that when we talk about the building of God or, or temple of God it's not only referring to the collective church or collective Christians but it is also true for individual Christians in other words you as an individual Christian are a temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you 1 Corinthians 6 19 do you not know that Holy Spirit comes into a person when the person becomes a Christian and dwells in that Christian forever. And when it is true of the collective people, the assembly of those people, then it is true also for the church. It is not only that the Holy Spirit dwells in the assembly and not in the individual, or vice versa, but the Holy Spirit dwells in the assembly because it dwells in the individual members that make up that assembly of believers. You can say that God saved you because he wants to come into you and live in you. To make you a dwelling place of God. Where do kings live? Kings, queens live in palaces. Presidents sometimes call the, their um, residential house as a presidential palace 
in the US, they might call it the White House. In some other countries, they might have special names for these special building in which the national leaders live. Why do these people go through all kinds of efforts and labor to make their dwelling place grand and huge and magnificent with all the fitting you know, facilities and decorations? It's because of their status, because of their position. The leader of a nation needs to live in a fitting building. Rich people and famous people build their houses to be mansions. In a sense, God chose us to come in and to live in us. And his work, his sanctifying work, is to see us become glorious like him. Not to be like earthly glorious mansions, but in terms of reflecting the glories of God, in terms of living a life that testifies to the grace and the glory of God. He continuously improves our life. It is a continuing project, isn't it? But nonetheless, it is a temple of God. And also he says in verse 21, it is a holy temple. In definite article, a holy temple. We can say that there's, there's only one temple of God, or this is not the temple in Jerusalem, to actually distinguish from the temple in Jerusalem, which was not really the temple of God by then. It was a den of thieves, as Jesus has said. But we are being built a temple of God. And Paul refers specifically to the church in Ephesus and also implying to all the churches that follow after that, whether they are Gentiles or Jews, they are being built as the temple of God. As a one temple of God. Dwelling place of God. So that God can come and live in them. The question that they had as they were listening to this must have been this. We are being built as a dwelling place of God. Are we worthy enough for God to come and dwell in us? Can we be worthy house of God? Now, these are the kind of questions that they must have had. Thinking deeply about how they are being sanctified and how they must embody that unity of the spirit that God had given them. So that they have this testimony that there is only one God. That there is only one body of Christ. And the message of God is that you can also come into the body of God and become part of this unity of the spirit. There are three things we can kind of think about and hopefully you can remember um, as a kind of concluding um, remark. The first thing is, as we live in the family of God, we have to remember that there is only one chief cornerstone and one foundation. And that's basically something that we cannot compromise. Christ, preach Christ. We also keep to the orthodox teaching of the apostles and the prophets from the scriptures. We should not deviate from that. So remember that there's only one chief cornerstone, no compromise there. And second, we are being built up. Cornerstone, foundation, framework, it's all finished and that cannot change. But we are changing all the time in a sense that we are being built up. God is building up continuously his church. He does it with his love and his grace, his forgiveness, also his rebuke, his correction, his instruction. So cornerstone, foundation, no change, it's finished. But the actual church is being built up and it is continuous work of God for the purpose of being a dwelling place of God. So remember that there is only one chief cornerstone. Second, we are continuously being built up. Third, for the purpose of being a dwelling place of God. And just like the Ephesian church must have done, we have a question too, don't we? Are these true of us? Especially as a local church, are we 
a dwelling place of God. Or are, we are, in a sense, but are we a worthy dwelling place of God? What can we do to become a better dwelling place of God, for God to come and live in us? To not give any reproach to the name of Christ. Also, as individual Christians, are you a worthy dwelling place of God? Whether you like it or not, Christ come, came into you if you're a Christian. Yes, you have come into Him and He has come into you. So He is in us and we are in Him. Then, are you a worthy dwelling place of God, Holy Spirit, Christ? Can people see you? the fitting place in which God lives. Well, let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us this message today. It is a sobering thought that God lives in us because we can see so many inconsist inconsistencies and so many shortcomings and areas that are lacking with so many things that we we would not say that we are worthy place in which you live. But Lord, you have made us your own and you have come into us. Not because we are perfect, but because we are perfect in you positionally and we are conditionally being perfected by your transforming work. And we believe that you taught us these things today so that we would become better an effective dwelling place of the Lord. May this happen continuously in our lives, Lord, individually and also as an assembly, local assembly of the saints in this place. And we pray, Lord, that you will be honored and glorified through our lives. And pray that more people, as they witness our lives, with desire to come into the house of God, into the family of God, and to this body of Christ, so that they can also enjoy this amazing blessing of being part of God's family. We thank you for this immense privilege. May we never forget that it is all by your grace and this amazing privilege that we have in you. We pray all these things in Jesus, our Lord's precious name. Amen.